Hello, everybody. We are now moving on to our next um, literary device that we're going to be analyzing uh, stories for in our boot camp, and that's characterization. And this is something that I'm sure that you are uh, somewhat familiar with, but we're going to be building on that. So hopefully you're learning some new things to go even deeper on analyzing characters. And we will be re-looking at Ken Liu's Paper Menagerie with it. So let's get started. So when you're analyzing for characterization, the thing to keep in mind is that human character is infinitely complex, variable, and ambiguous. And great characters are complex, variable, and ambiguous. There are so many of us and so many different experiences, and we're all very different yet unified. And we're not clearly all evil or all good. We're you know a mix of all the above and it's really difficult to be understood and we have a lot we change through our lives right so good stories are able to present this truth about the human experience and that's what characterization is to be looking for and we're not here to summarize what a character has done that's plot summary right and we're not here to just simply say so and so was a nice guy or so and so was a jerk we're here to do more than that with characterizing, uh, with our analysis of characterization. What I want to see is that you're showing me some insight that through this character, what have you understood or learned um, or come to see through them, right? They're kind of an avatar for us in a way almost. We are reading through them something that is true about us, okay? And so, the goal is for you to describe convincingly who a character is, sure, but even more so to what, how do they, what truth do they illustrate and how do they about our human nature or the human experience, okay? So that's kind of the end goal is to convincingly, ex to in, with some depth, explain who this character is and what do they teach us, okay? So again, we're going to talk about this commercial fiction versus literary fiction, okay? When we are watching or reading um, kind of escapist literature, which is fun and it's all good, um, it's a little bit different than the characterization for the, the big stuff, the capital L literature. Usually in commercial fiction, characters are simple, they're two-dimensional, or they're stereotypical. They tend to be easily identifiable or clearly labeled as good or bad. And they tend to be, the main character, the protagonist, tends to be very attractive, incredibly sympathetic, pretty decent, like maybe one flaw or two, but generally a good person with larger than life qualities, kind of unrealistic, like someone we all wish we could be, but doesn't exist, you know? Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Those are wonderful things to have as kind of like escapist goals for ourselves, like you know, wishing you were somebody else. We all have those moments and there's a place for that. And it is important, but um, it's a little bit different when you do literary fiction. With commercial fiction, the, the main characters tend to not be, if they do have vices, they're not really too ob objectionable, right? Like, you know, they're not going to be somebody that's really, really bad, <laughs> like a, you know, a cannibal or something, right? That's not going to happen. Um, and but they may be rebellious. We as Americans, a lot of our literature tends to have the protagonist as a rebel in some way. That's something that we look up to someone who's got the courage to be a rebel. And it does get kind of cliche and there's nothing wrong with rebellious characters, but that that tends to be used a lot in commercial fiction. Right. Um, and as I said, we live vicariously through them. Right. We wish we were them in some way. It's a kind of pretending to be somebody else kind of stuff. And the main aim for characters in commercial fiction is to carry the plot forward. It's just to kind of help move the story forward. We're not really learning anything through that character, except maybe something really pat and obvious. Um, we're just kind of having fun, you know? With literary fiction, it's like we're going down a darker path usually. With literary fiction, characters aren't necessarily unattractive, but they might be. Like there's a book called The uh, Confederacy of Dunces where the main character is this fat, pretty despicable, gross guy, yet it's through his character that we kind of 
learn a lot and we do become sympathetic with them. They are, they're much more real. They're much more like us, flawed, annoying, complicated, right? They're less likely able to like pigeonhole them or label them as like good guy, bad guy, or, you know, cool guy or whatever. They're they're just more um, complicated. It's hard to slap a single label on them if they're done well. And as, I, and as I mentioned with the Confederacy of Dunces, sometimes they're downright unsympathetic or despicable. Um, I don't know if I'll go so far as to say the Joker is literary fiction, but it's, it's pushing it, right? There's some real strong literary elements in that. It's a, it's a higher end story. And the main character, I mean, you have pity for him, but if you knew that guy in real life, if you had to go to school or work with him, you would be frightened of him. You'd want nothing to do with him. And he would be, and he's a dangerous person, right? The Joker is, is very mentally disturbed. But through that character study, we are able to understand his despicability, right? His, even though he's a murderer, we can kind of have this kind of pity for him and understand where he's coming from. So he's more of an anti-hero than a villain in his, um, in the Joker and his origin story. Right. So if you've seen that, you know what I'm talking about. Um, that's just what came to my mind. I'm sure you can think of other main characters where you think they're pretty awful. Um, like you guys might read the catcher in the rye next year, your junior year. And the main character is, he's, he's complicated. Um, some people love him, even though he is a hot mess. And some people hate him. Like my oldest son cannot stand him. He, he thinks he's, he's, he likes to call everybody a phony, but he's the big phony. So he finds him to be a hypocrite. But that's, that's all of us. We're all a bunch of hypocrites. We say one thing and do another. We believe one thing about ourselves, but maybe that, maybe that's not actually true or we don't really understand who we are. That, that's all of us, man. Because we are just a mixture of both good and evil. You know, we're... We have beautiful things and ugly things about us, all of us. And that makes them more real, more honest. And so when you're reading literary fiction, it's not so much escapism as it is catharsis, being able to cry with them, being able to laugh with them, being able to say, oh man, I'm with you. I, I understand you. So they're much more likely to be empathetic and understanding, uh, or we are, I should say, than just a character that we use for escape. One's like a vehicle for just, it's one's like a roller coaster, you know? And the other one's a real friend. So it's a little different, you know? So literary fiction, we also get to see their inner life a lot more. So I know some of you in the Ed Puzzle um, on conflict and plot were talking about how you didn't really have an example for um, an inner conflict story. And maybe that's because you've only been exposed to a lot of commercial fiction. With literary fiction, it tends to be much more focusing on the inner life, a lot more about the inner struggle of the person with themselves or something they have to do, you know, that's all about their heart. And, and the reason why that's important and more, more prevalent in literary fiction is that's what we learn from. We learn from those emotional struggles, right? We get to actually know them better as opposed to just look up to them. We get to be with them and get them and understand them as a human being, even if they're like a teddy bear, right? Because the aim of literary fiction, you guys, is to explore a human psychology and the motivation of why we do what we do. It's like therapy. It really is. So it's about understanding why we do the things we do and to be more empathetic of other people and to forgive ourselves a little bit, right? So that, that is the purpose of literary fiction, where it's not escape, it's facing our truths, looking into the mirror of truth and learning from all the mistakes of all these other people because they're us, okay, in some way. So we're going to pause right here, and I want you guys to answer the question in the text box. I want you to tell me, I guess it's a, it's a command, but same, same. Please tell me the difference between characterization in literary fiction versus commercial fiction how are the aims different what do they tend to be how, how are they differently portrayed so put that in the text box for me all right now we're moving on to some things we need to be looking out for in a couple different categories um one of the big things you want to think about is 
when you're trying to gather evidence to analyze this character, you're looking at direct characterization and indirect characterization. The, how the author's presenting them directly versus indirectly. I bet you've heard this stuff before, but let me go over it just in case. So direct presentation is when the author tells us. There's no work involved for us as readers. You just said the guy was angry. I didn't have to figure that out. You said he was angry. He's angry. Okay. Unless they're being ironic. And what I mean by that is sometimes when um, narrators are describing someone, they could be sarcastic in their voice and we have to read in between the lines. Maybe that's not really what's going on. But generally when someone, when a, when a, when a narrator is telling you something in a direct fashion, you know, it's, it's, you're just telling me, you're not showing me. That's indirect presentation. Indirect characterization is when you, the reader, have to interpret or judge for yourself by gathering all this information of hints, clues. And one of the ways you can kind of think about that through the mnemonic device of STEEL for indirect characterization means, so STEEL stands for says, thinks, effects on others, actions, and looks. And so how does the author show us that he's angry by the words that he says? How the dialogue's going. How does the author show us he's angry by the thoughts that we're allowed to see if we get to see inside their head? How does the author show us that he's angry by how he affects other people, right? How they're reacting to him. How does the author show us through his actions that he's angry, right? It's a lot different to say he was angry versus he ran off, um, he, he ran from the table um, crumpling the paper and swearing as he threw it in the trash, right? Okay, he's mad. I could make that judgment from seeing that he was running away from the table and upset about some piece of paper and swearing as he's crumpling it up, all that kind of angry action, right? And the swearing of what he's saying. You're showing me he's angry, right? And if I added like how he looks too, if I talked about like the grimace on his face, that grimace shows me he, he's angry. So that's going to be where the meat is in literary fiction. It tends to be more showing me more than telling me. Now in movies, it's mostly show, of course, because it's pictures. It's the pictures. But with literary fiction versus commercial fiction in the novel form, um, it's going to be a lot more indirect characterization, possibly, though both authors use both kinds. However, weaker, I shouldn't say commercial for this. I would say weaker writing tells you everything, gives you nothing to even decide for yourself. It's just spoon feeding you information and telling you what to think rather than letting you figure out for yourself, giving you that respect to figure it out. So here's an example of a, a showing, right? So feeling defeated. So I've got her thoughts. Alice nodded weakly as she walked away with tears in her eyes. So her actions and how she looks. Okay. So I'm, sh I'm being shown that she's sad. Okay. So direct presentation, all authors need to use this sometimes. Sometimes you just need to get to the point. It's clear. It's economical, right? Good writers, though, use it sparingly, commercial or literary, because you can be a really good commercial writer, right? Like J.K. Rowling's a really good commercial writer. Um, Anne Rice, really good commercial writer. Stephen King, really good commercial writer. Um, but uh, the higher end author tends to not tell you so much, but show you right? So remember the axiom show, don't tell when you tell me stuff. Also, you want to show me what you're thinking, not just tell me. Okay. And the reason why this is what we're going to be looking for the most and is the probably the most difficult too, because you have to think is that it's more realistic impression of how we are. Like people don't just walk around and tell us everything they think we have to figure it out. Don't we? And even when they tell us, we'll have to like read in between the lines and figure stuff out. Right. We, it's more, we connect with it more too. It, when it's dramatized, we're able to really see their emotions and believe it. Right. I'm going to be much more affected if I watch someone die in front of me in a story, not real life. Let's not go there. Right. Then you just say the guy died. Right. I'm going to weep as I see the scene. I get to, you know, interact with that story rather than you just telling me someone passed away generally. Right. So we want to make sure that we're, you know, looking out for those kinds of clues when we're doing characterization mostly. 
So we're going to pause again. I would like you to tell me what is the difference between direct and indirect presentation of a character in fiction? How, how are they presented differently and what do you need to look out for for each? Okay, some more things to look out for. We also want to be thinking about consistency in characterization, right? Like characters can change over time. That's called development of a character. That's, those are good characters that grow and learn just like we are. Like, have you ever regretted anything? Good, that means you've grown as a person. You're now different, you're better. I know it stinks to regret, but it is a sign that you've changed. That's fine but it needs to be consistent. It needs to make sense. It needs to be earned, right? And that's usually kind of like through their motivations, right? Like, do we understand why they're doing things or it just stuff seems to be random? Like what's going on here? So some of the things you wanna be thinking about is the consistency of the character and their motivations. And that leads to the believability, the big fancy words, plausibility, right? Am I, are you convincing me that you're, a living, breathing human being when I'm at least, you know, in that suspension of disbelief that we all participate in when we read books or watch movies, right? Like the Marvel movies, if you looked at them, you would think they're crazy. That's nonsense. Is this a fever dream? But when we go to the movies, we kind of suspend our disbelief and just get absorbed into that world, right? Just like when we're dreaming. But we get pulled out of that dream if the motivations don't make sense and the characters are inconsistent. For example, if you recall, and, and I think it's an end game, the last one, where Captain America is in the elevator. If we look just at that scene of the elevator, we didn't know why he was doing what he was doing. And he, we saw him just whisper to the other guy, hey, Hydra. He'd be like, what? He's a Nazi? Dun, dun, dun. That wasn't earned, right? That's so cheap and messed up. If we just looked at it, like if it wasn't presented as this kind of joke, right? That he's, you know playing on him because he, he knows they're Hydra agents, but he didn't know at the time, right? If, if, if Captain America all of a sudden really was a Hydra agent, just out of nowhere, that would be so inconsistent with everything he's done is fighting fascism, being the, the biggest anti-Nazi guy whose only motivation is to do good and to get back to his lady love. That just doesn't even make sense, right? And the ending of Endgame makes sense too. His inner conflict about what he should do, right? Continue to save the world or go live his life, like retire. Like did he, you know, that, that motivation, it makes sense. That's why he did what he did. Even though some of you might be like, but the world needs a Captain America, which of course he gave it away, right? There, there still is one. And that's true in the comics, right? Captain America is different now. So, you know, we something needs to be consistent the motivations need to make sense for it to all be plausible otherwise the story fails and we kind of walk away disappointed and going wah, wah. that's not a good story so that's one of the things that we could be critiquing as we're reading stories about the care is it consistent are the motivate or what they're doing do the motivations make sense and when they don't ask questions like why are they doing that maybe there's something going on there and it will pay off later right and that that leap means something okay other things to look out for um, that a lot of um, both literary and commercial fiction do are the use of flat and round characters. If you recall, flat characters are sometimes called like two dimensional characters. They're just kind of like side characters that just come in and out. We don't really need to know much about them. You know, you can just kind of sum up their existence in a sentence or two. And they tend to be stereotypical or what we call stock characters. For example, the funny fat friend. In just about every group of kids movie I have ever seen, there is a funny fat friend. Think about it. The Goonies. The Sandlot. Stand By Me. I don't know about It. That's a little bit different. But it, there's probably, though, a funny, like, the, the Joker, right? The kind of jokester guy, right? There's the nerd, right? There's these kind of stock characters we, we don't need to know much. Maybe they don't have that because their characters are more developed. That book is huge. If you ever decide to read it and your parents let you, it is a tome. Um, so another example might be like in Disney's Wicked Stepmother, right? We, we know every, we just see her, we know everything about her that we need to know. And those, these are for minor characters, you know, cause not every character in your life is going to be a major character that's fully fleshed out. There are some people that just walk in and out of your life, right? 
we're not going to really probably analyze those characters too much. We're going to be looking more at the round characters that are complex, that have three dimension to them, that they feel more real, right? These are going to be more of the major characters we're going to focus on, and they're usually less classifiable. It's usually harder to put them into one category or two categories. There's more to them than that. Even if they are nerdy or fat or funny, there's they're more than that. Okay. Good stories need both to be convincing. Not everybody can be a main character. And that makes me wonder, who are you a main character in, in somebody else's story? And who are you just a stock character? Yeah, that's a, that's a big one. Okay. So again, I'm going to pause and I want you guys to type in the text box in your own words. Can you explain to me the difference between flat characters round characters and then the stock characters of course are part of the flat characters tell me about like i mean there's flat but then there's stock tell me maybe the difference between flat and stock and then versus round i guess i should have moved that around in the question all right some other things to look out for so you need to be thinking about static characters versus dynamic characters again this is stuff you might have heard before Static characters don't change. And that's usually flat characters don't change. Protagonists, if they don't change, eh, it's probably not literary fiction, okay? Static means they just kind of stay the same, whereas developing or dynamic characters, they do go through some major change, okay? And it's a meaningful change of either like who they are, something about their personality or something they understand about the world, right? They can go from evil to good, good to evil, although that's a that's a rainbow scale, right? Um, the personality can change from being someone who's, um, uh, you know, a jerk to a nice guy, right? Or their outlook on life could shift. Um, think about Snape in Harry Potter, if you know that, right? He comes off at first as this kind of wicked stepfather almost, right? This kind of stock villain almost that is very mean to Harry and constantly he's just the mean teacher that wants to bust him all the time. But then you learn through the story that he's actually not that at all, that he's like a triple agent. Um, and that he was once a very angry, messed up person who was a, you know, kind of a villainous person because he was so hurt and bullied. Um, but he learned to love someone so much that he became a hero and changed as a human being. He went from being a death eater to the guy that saved Harry's life was supposed to be his uh, uh his siblings godfather because his mom was pregnant when she died in case you didn't know that and snape was going to be the godfather so sad and right, so he changes a total human being so you don't have to necessarily be a protagonist to be dynamic and that change shows something important about going from being a flawed person to having hope that you can change and be a better person right so it can be a large change, it could be a small change from positive to negative or vice versa, right? And it usually happens through a kind of epiphany, right? There's some moment of like spiritual insight or some kind of light bulb going off where you went, oh my goodness, what have I done, right? We kind of realize and there's this turning point and the fancy, the fancy Greek word is peripatia, right? This kind of turning point. If you notice the gif, it's a turning pretty neat how it shifts from the 3d perspective usually when i show this in class everybody goes whoa <laughs> so some things to think about is there a convincing change in this character three things have to happen i already said that one whoops but, uh, no 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 this is fine it's fine so convincing change three criteria you have to be consistent it has to be sufficiently motivated, as I said, and there needs to be sufficient time. So something else to maybe add to that, right? There's got to be sufficient time. You, it t you can't just change overnight as much as we may wish to, right? It takes time. It took years for Snape to become a better person. Years. I mean, it took him years to stop kind of hate loving Harry, right? You'd see his eyes and love him and then see his like shape and hate him because it reminded him of his dad who was his bully, right? And stole the woman he loved, right? So these essential changes in human character don't usually occur suddenly. We don't change overnight as much as we may want to. It takes time to become a better or worse person, right? As I said, it's got to be earned, and that gives it what's called verisimilitude, which I talked about in the last lecture, which means lifelikeness. 
right? At least in the way of being believable in its feelings, not necessarily believable characters, but believable emotional change. So what are some differences between static characters and dynamic characters? From any movie or book that you know, name a static character and a dynamic character and explain to me how you know that one was static and one was dynamic about them. Movie or book, don't care. So the main takeaway before I leave, before you leave me or I leave you or whatever, when analyzing stories for characterization, you need to ask yourself, oops, these questions, typo, in view of all that matters of the, of the, of the, of the matters aforementioned, blah, what does the author apparently wish us to think and feel about what happens to this character? What are we learning through them? Okay. That's the, all the other things we talked about are kind of vehicles to get to this question. What am I being shown through this character and how they change through the story? Okay. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day and that this wasn't the worst thing in the universe. And because you got more torture coming. All right. So we're going to apply this to Ken Liu's um, paper menagerie and add a couple more errands to our story together. See you soon.